All right, uh, we're approaching uh, uh, this uh, Friday night is the first evening of Sukkot, and the second day of Chalamoed, the eighteenth of uh, the eighteenth of Tishrei is my father's yard site. So while we might have something special during the week. But I would like to start off by say, mentioning something that my father suggested in regard to Sukkot. And I have certain questions on it. I will suggest an answer. And then I would give my own approach to the question that my father raised. Uh, my father was intrigued by the fact that he considered Sukkot to be like two holidays that coincide at the same time. On one hand, Sukkot is Chag HaSukkos. That's the holiday that we, that, that we sit in the Sukkah. On the other hand, Sukkot is known as Chag HaOsif. It's the harvest holiday. And the and and the, the Lulav and Esrig, the Adasim Baravos, is indicative of the agricultural uh, phenomena that is taking place in Eretz Israel at that time of the year. So the Lulav and Esrig, the Adasim Baravos, that's indicative of that's expressive. Of, uh, of the changing season, which is the basis for Sukkot being the harvest holiday. And my father said that these two ideas in Sukkot, one Chag HaSukkos and the other Chag Osef, Chag HaSukkos is the holiday of the booths, and it commemorates the fact that the Jewish people in the desert lived in booths. There is a discussion in the Gemara whether the booths were, were miraculously uh, formed by the heavenly clouds or the booths were. were made by men and but whatever it is but we re-experience what took place to our ancestors in the desert by living in booths and the and the uh, Chag Asif is the is the harvest holiday now my father said these two ideas represent two, ma two ways that Abraham Avinu identified himself. On one hand, Avram, when Avram met with the Bnei Ches, when he was trying to purchase a burial plot for his wife, Sarah, and he pleaded or dealt with the, the people of Ches to acquire the Mara Samach Pela. So he, he said to them, Ger Vitosha Vanochi Mahem. Ger means an immigrant, a, someone who converts to Judaism is called a Ger. To a certain degree, he's an immigrant to the Jew, into the Jewish people. The word ger comes from the word gargir. Gargir means a seed. A seed is something that does not have roots. An immigrant comes into a country, he does not have yet roots in the country. So Avram on one hand, he says, I was not born in this country. 
I'm an immigrant in this country. I don't have roots. I don't have a family plot. And he asked the Bnei Ches to sell him the, the Maras HaMachpela, the, uh, the cave of Machpela, to be a burial plot for Sora and for the, eventually, for the next three, gener next two generations. And, but on the other hand, Avram said, he's not just a gear, not just an immigrant. He's a Toshav. He's a resident. He's a citizen. He has roots. He feels secure. Why? Rashi says, because God gave the promised him the whole land of Israel. But according to the simple explanation, we could explain it on the basis of the fact he resided there for many years. But even though he resided there for many years, on one hand, he attained the status of being a Tosha, of being a citizen. He was well respected. As we see, the Bnei Chais referred to him, Nesi Elakim you, you, you are a prince of God in our midst. But on the other hand, he did not lose his status as a, as a gear, as an immigrant. And my father said, the mitzvah of sukkah, when one dwells in the sukkah, he, he is exposed to nature. It represents not having security. It represents the idea of a gear, a person without roots. On the other hand, the mitzvah, the, the Chag Osef, the holiday of Sukkot is the harvest holiday. When we bring our crops in, we feel secure. There is economic security. And my father said to a certain degree, every person is both a ger and a toshav. On one hand, we live in houses. We feel secure. On the other hand, we know that that the most secure person is really insecure. I heard this thought from my father in the early 1960s. And I remember my father saying, who had more security than President Kennedy? He says, with all the security, with all the secret service, one bullet from a rifle in Dallas, Texas, killed him. So even the most secure person, the one who has the most guards, is also insecure. And my father said, mentioned, that the, in the Haftorah, of Sukkis, we say, Zos Tihei Chatas Mitzrayim. This will be the sin of Egypt, the Chatas Kol Hagoyim, and the sin of all the nations. Asher Lo Yalu, that they will not go. It talks about the end of days, that they will not go up to celebrate the holiday of Sukkis. In other words, these are, in a sense, the nations of the, that are the enemies of the, of the Jewish people. What motivates them? What motivates them is that they don't want to celebrate the holiday of Sukkot. 
What do they want to celebrate? They want to celebrate the Chagosim. They want, don't want to recognize their insecurity. They're in denial of their insecurity. And in a certain sense, we can attribute there are certain people that they ignore the facts of life. And what exists is what exists in their mind. And if they're in denial of the facts of life, they feel secure. Now, and it's very interesting, the Pasuk says, there are all kinds of drashos in halacha, but the simple reading of the pasuk is kol ha'ezrach, every citizen, and ezrach is a citizen, it's a person who has roots. Kol ha'ezrach b'Yisrael yeshu basukos. Every citizen among the Jews has to sit in the sukkah because there comes times when we really believe that because of the security we have, there's nothing to be feel insecure about. So the holiday of sukkahs comes and says, yes, you have a Chag Asaf. You are celebrating the harvest holiday. You have economic security. But the richest person, the most secure person, can also face situations of danger. Just as President Kennedy was assassinated in spite of all the Secret Service that was there. And And matter of fact, I think that this idea is very apropos to the situation we find ourselves today. Today, we, today we, we, um, uh, uh, t t today, today we, we, we're facing an epidemic. It's been a hundred years, more than a hundred years since we had this less, last epidemic of this proportion. And to a certain degree, we felt secure. And perhaps part of the lesson that, this, that we have to learn from this epidemic is there are always things that can happen that can make us insecure. And to a certain degree, this happened also in 9-11, September 11th, when the World Trade Center was destroyed as a result of the planes that flew into the World Trade Center, or that crashed into the World Trade Center. We know that when we, walk, when we visited Israel, every time we walked into a grocery store, there were guards at the door. Very often we would be checked. They had a sense of security. But in the United States, we foolishly believed that our situation is altogether different. And then September 11th came. And then all of a sudden, in all the airports, you had to be checked in a much stronger form than was previously. And then, 
And then when there were other acts of violence, so when we went to office buildings, we had to show identification. In the old days, we never had to show identification. And we were also checked by monitors to see if we had any weapons. Why is that? But beforehand, we didn't have to do that because Americans thought that they only celebrate the Chag HaOsif. They only celebrate the taking in of the crop. They only celebrate that they have a secure, they have security, a secure situation. There is nothing for them to worry about. And then with September 11th, we understood that as secure as we were, there is what to worry about. And to a certain degree, it appears to me that with all the rioting that has recently taken place in the streets of the United States, we have become less secure and certainly businesses have become less secure than, than some of the countries who we look down at from a security perspective. And so the holiday of Sukkis commemorates or reminds us of our insecurity. Technically, Sukkis in America, we can't do that. In America, when we go into the Sukkah, for the most part, all we do is eat our meals in the sukkah. But if we would live in areas where the weather would be conducive to, to, to dwelling in the fullest sense, we would be required to live in the sukkah. We would be required to sleep in the sukkah. And when we live in the sukkah, we are exposed to all the elements of nature. And we get a, sense, a certain sense of insecurity. Sometimes we're concerned, maybe somebody from the outside, especially when we're in the sukkah, sukkah at night, maybe somebody from the outside will come not to talk about other problems, problems of weather. It's true, when the weather becomes bad, we're not required to sit in the sukkah. But you never know. Something could happen momentarily. Now, I was somewhat troubled with my father's explanation that sukkah represents the insecurity of man. Because when you think about sukkahs, you think about celebration. What do we do in the sukkah? We eat. It doesn't seem like a tense situation. The midst of sukkah is one that perhaps to a certain degree is also identified with Samachta Bechagecha. It's true, the Samachta Bechagecha, you should be happy, you should be joyful. It deals primarily with the Lulav, with the Lulav and Esrik. But it would seem that to a certain degree, the nature of the midst of sukkah of eating in the sukkah is also indicative of joy. So how is it that the joy is associated with this feeling of insecurity? And I want to explain, it's not an exact comparison, but it has something to do with the situation we find ourselves today in. The Gemara in, y in Yavamis, I think that fine base, mentions 
that when the Jewish people were in the desert, so because of the weather conditions, they were not able to circumcise their children. There's a discussion in the Gemara of what, what the weather conditions were. It seems that they, they didn't have the proper winds that are necessary for the healing process. They didn't have the proper sunlight uh, because of the clouds that, that, uh, that hid the sunlight. And the Gemara says, therefore, in days when the southern wind does not blow, And in days that are very cloudy, I, I, from my father, I got the impression that it would be something like a sandstorm. So my father said this doesn't did not apply today to the because today we live in houses, but the way the living conditions were in those days to circumcise your children with these type of weather conditions was considered some sort of sakana. Was, it, it did not contribute well to the healing of the circumcision. And the, but then the Gemara adds, Ba'achshav the Dashu Be'rabbin. But now that the multitudes do it, Shomer P'sayim Hashem. God watches over the simple folk. What's the idea? The idea is we're not dealing with people who are attempting suicide. Obviously, just because you live in a society where people believe uh, jump off roofs doesn't mean that one should jump off a roof. We're dealing where there is a small chance of danger. So if it's Doshu Rabin, if it's something that the multitudes do, then you're allowed to place yourself in that danger. You're not required, according to the Ritva, to place yourself in that danger. Matter of fact, it's very interesting. The Ritva says that let's say somebody on the eighth day, that is the that is the eighth day that since the birth of his son, the the they, it was uh, there was a sandstorm. Let's assume it was a sandstorm. So it was already accepted, and it, we're dealing when it was already accepted to perform circumcisions when there is a sandstorm. But a person could say, the Ritva says, I consider it dangerous. I don't want to perform the circumcision on my son or have my son circumcised on this day. Even though the danger is somewhat minute. Nevertheless, And I'm allowed to do it because God watches over the simple folks. In other words, people who are not concerned about danger, they're not considered the most, but it's something that the multitudes are not concerned about. Nevertheless, they're not considered the most sophisticated individuals. People who think of the repercussions of what they're doing will act in a stringent manner because they understand that it's not worth endangering their lives or the lives of their children just because the multitudes do it. Now, let's say right now, there is a whole discussion about 
uh, the significance of wearing masks because of the virus, because of COVID. Uh, and, and there's also about social distancing. And anybody who thinks for themselves understands that it's worth wearing a mask. What is more important than life itself, both from a halachic perspective and a simple thinking perspective? You don't have to be a great scholar to understand the foolishness in not covering your face with a mask when you come in contact with people and say, oh, it's only someone who, I only have to worry if I know the person has COVID. Yeah, but there's someone who might have COVID and you didn't know it. So a person doesn't have to be the world's greatest genius to understand it. But because we want all kinds of, we, we want all kinds of, uh, of uh, excuses not to wear a mask. So what do we do? We come up with this idea, herd immunity. Not that there isn't such a concept, but it certainly doesn't work. We have people coming and going from one place to another. The only herd immunity there is, is because the herd doesn't think and they follow one another. They do what the group does. Because for some reason, when you're part of a group, you cease to think for yourself. You let the group think for, you, for themselves. As a group, if a person thinks for himself, then he understands the foolishness of it. You know, there is a story about the, the, wise, the wise people of Chelem. The wise people, it once happened that the bridge, now Chelem was a city that in folklore, whether it's true or not, I don't know. I'm not going to... I'm not going to say, but in folklore, they were not known for being the wisest people. They were the Psyim. They were the simple people. And the bridge in Chelem broke. And as a result of the bridge breaking, a lot of people were falling through the hole of the bridge, the hole on the bridge tripping over it and they were all and these people were taken to the hospital they were seriously injured and the wise people of Chelem the council of the wise people of Chelem came to how should we how do we deal with these cri this crisis and the wise people of Chelem decided that because of the broken bridge they will, and the people going to the hospital, they will raise the allocation to the hospital instead of just fixing the bridge. And that's the situation that we are facing today. People become simple when it's obvious that they're wrong. Didn't they learn a lesson in March? Oh, so they found an excuse and they searched for a doctor. When the Torah, when the halacha tells us how careful you have to be with Sakonis Nefashos. My great grandfather, Reb Chaim, when there was an epidemic in Brisk, he said, even after the epidemic is over, be careful. Don't go out, don't mix because that epidemic could come back again. 
Reb Chaim was known to be a great thinker, perhaps one of the greatest thinkers of his time. But what do we have, unfortunately? We have today Chachme Chelem! And we can't even say Shomer Psayim Hashem because the people, when you, first of all, you take a look outside. And this is an embarrassment for us. When you take a look outside, people are constantly wearing masks. I don't think you could say, Dashu Bey Rabin. And not only it's an embarrassment for us, but it causes us trouble. And I'm not talking about Chil Hashem. I'm talking about Sakonis the Fashis. What happens? We read in the papers about the communities on the East Coast. That it that is hit hardest. And unfortunately, we know which these communities are. In our community, we don't have to refer to the virus as the Chinese virus. We can refer to it as with the names of the of, of many Jewish communities. But you know how it's going to come out in the world? In the world, it's going to come out the Jewish virus. At one time, there was uh, the, the, some of the one gr Arab group who was close with Israel massacred, but they were associated with Israel, massacred uh, some Muslims in a village. At that time, Begin was the prime minister, and there was no Jews involved. There was no Jews involved. But it happened to be allies of Israel that caused the massacre. And at that time, my uncle called Menachem Begin, and he told Menachem Begin, you have to point, the, and I want to tell you, my father disagreed with my uncle on this point. But he told Menachem Begin, you have to point the committee to investigate. And he says, even if it involves violating the Shabbos, because if they identify this massacre with Israel, if they identify this massacre with the Jewish people, so you're endangering the lives of Jews everywhere, especially in the Arab world. My father felt differently, not that he disagreed logically. He just felt that, that, uh, that uh, under the circumstances at that time, that he felt that the, at that time, since it was not done by Jews, that wouldn't be the case. It was done, it was done by, by a group of Arabs who happened to be allies for their own purposes of Israel. Of course, when, the, when things changed, they turned against Israel. So, but in other words, I'm not, I'm not talking now about we'll look bad in the eyes of the non-Jews. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when people, especially people whose families become affected, even if they didn't come in contact with these people. The, Jews, the Jewish people are going to be blamed. It'll be the Jewish virus. Why? Because they don't think. They're simple-minded. They might memorize. They might repeat. And they might follow the herd. 
but they don't think for themselves. And I think, so, but Shomer Psayim Hashem does not apply here because here you take a look for many reasons. First of all, the danger is pretty great. Secondly, and you're not only, it's not only you're endangering yourself, you're endangering others. Perhaps you have the right to choose for yourself. And, and, and also, it's, it, 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 so it's not, it's not something that's accepted yet. So uh, not to wear masks. So you look around, not only that, but say in New York State, uh, the the mayor made a law. Um, the, the people were not complying, and they were ignoring, especially in some of our neighborhoods. They were ignoring the requirement. So, the mayor made a. I just what I was told. Made a law that anybody caught not wearing a mask in certain situations will be fined a thousand dollars. All of a sudden, overnight, everybody started wearing a mask. You know, the word shvichas damen, which in Hebrew means spilling of blood, in Aramaic means spilling of money. It seems that, it would seem very strange but people are more concerned about the Aramaic understanding of Shvi Chastamim than the Hebrew explanation of Shvi Chastamim. So, but in any case, but once it becomes accepted, and once the danger is very, very minimal, neither of which is true in this situation, so if it becomes accepted, one is allowed one is allowed to put himself in that danger because it's, it becomes a normal part, it becomes a normal part of life. And because it becomes a normal part of life, he, because of his simplicity of understanding, is able to say, I re- God will help me. So, Now, now, what is the mitzvah of sukkah? And what is the connection between sukkah, between sukkah, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippurim? That these three holidays come immediately, one after the other. And I've discussed in the past the two approaches of the Rambam and the Ramban. The Rambam's opinion is that the ultimate world to come is the world of the souls. There is Tchias HaMesim, but after that, after the dead become alive again, after living a, a, a long life again, a person dies again and his soul goes into the world of the souls, close to God, but... The Ramban's opinion is just the reverse. The Ramban's opinion is, on the contrary, the Ramban's opinion is that the uh, that when a person dies, his body goes. That excuse me, he go, his soul goes into the world of the souls, but then ultimately, he is he comes back down to earth, and the way the Ramban says it, those that are merit to come back, back down to earth, they will live continuously. Now, it was, what's the idea behind it? In other words, according to the Ramban, why, why is it necessary for a person, a person first goes to the world of the souls? Why? What is the idea behind it? The idea behind it is that in this physical world, in this mundane world, we, we did not, 
we have, in a sense, uh, as I mentioned, the Mikubalim, the the, the 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 mystics, Jewish mysticism, says that nature covers the presence of God. So the covering that hides God. So when we go, in a sense, because we become so involved in the physical world, our spirituality became it became less relevant in our lives. So after we leave this world, in a sense, we go to the world of the souls, which focuses on spirituality, which focuses on this closeness to God without a curtain that hides God. And, but ultimately, the goal, according to the Ramban, is to return to this world and to recognize God in this world. And in a sense, we can explain Rosh Hashanah and Yom HaKippurim. In other words, all year round, in this mundane world, somehow we did not focus as much as we should on God, on spirituality. We got involved in everything in the physical world. And that curtain hid God. And we didn't penetrate the curtain of, the, we did not penetrate the curtain of nature to see God. And because of that, so we have to, in a sense, get a, bat, a spiritual battery recharge. And we have to rise above the mundane physical world. And initially we have Rosh Hashanah, where we focus on God being our king. And then we go into the spiritual world. As I mentioned that Yom HaKippurim is a form of the world of the souls in miniature. That's why we fast and there are no physical pleasures. We rise above this mundane world. But the ultimate goal is to come back down to earth, come back down to this world, and to see God in this world, to penetrate the curtain of nature, and to imbue this world with spirituality and recognize the presence of God in this world. That's what, and what is that? What is Sukkis? What is the mitzvah of Sukkot? As I mentioned, in America, we cannot fulfill the mitzvah in the way it should be ideally observed. But in places where the weather is better. So you have to live your life. There's really, when you think about it, there is very little ritual that is done in the Sukkot. What is the mitzvah of Sukkot? Living your normal life, eating, drinking, sleeping. And the Gemara tells us that one is not allowed to derive benefits other than the, where the, what the mitzvah allows. And, and, and it includes from the walls of the sukkah, from the schach, the covering of the sukkah. And the, why? because it's like a chagiga, it's like a sacrifice. In other words, a sacrifice has holiness. So we are sanctifying. What are we sanctifying? There's no mitzvah specifically of davening in a sukkah. It's eating, drinking. We're sanctifying our mundane life. That's the mitzvah of sukkah. The mitzvah of sukkah, in a sense, is leading the normal life, but it's covered, we are covered by, by, by the sukkah, which in a sense has the sanctity to a certain degree of the sacrifices. It sanctifies 
our normal living conditions, our normal li- way of living our life. In other words, sanctity, sanctification doesn't manifest itself only in davening and in learning, but sanctification is most important in the way we live, in the, the daily routine of our lives, the eating and the drinking, that's part of, san- of leading a sanctified life also. So we leave Yom HaKippurim, where we're a total spiritual world. And we go into the sukkah, which represents leading our normal life, but recognizing God's presence in this world and as part of our normal life. And I think... Along the same lines, we could suggest that, that perhaps this is what my father meant. I was troubled. My father said, the sukkah represents the idea that we are insecure. And yet the whole nature of the way we act in the sukkah is one of celebration. So we celebrate our insecurity. The answer is, if our, our daily lives, there is insecurity. But if we see God as part of our daily lives, then we can, have, we can have trust in God that we will be able to overcome these insecurities and we won't have to worry about these insecurities. We have to realize that we are insecure. But God compensates those insecurities by his by recognize when we recognize his presence in our daily life. And I think that perhaps is the celebration that we do in the sukkah. We celebrate that God is taking care of us, that God recognizes our insecurities. He recognizes that we're exposed to all the elements of nature. He recognizes that there are people who are, want to cause us harm. But on a day-to-day basis, God is constantly spreading his protection over us. And that's the mitzvah of sukkah. The mitzvah of sukkah is giving thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the for making up for the insecurities that we have in our life. Okay. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. Where's the chat? I don't even see the chat right now. Well, no, no questions are in the chat. Okay. 